Hello everyone and welcome to another video here at Whiteboard Doctor. Today we have a very important and in my opinion central topic for understanding both how the human body works at baseline as well as how we can best care for a critically ill patient and that is oxygen content and oxygen delivery. And We're going to explain these clearly both from a conceptual standpoint and an equation standpoint. This video is more so targeting those that work within the medical field, whether it be trainees, students, or practitioners. Um, obviously, though, as we always say, we encourage anybody with an interest to watch the video. Uh, we do think there are things to learn in the video, even for those that do not work directly in medicine. What we're going to go into today is we're going to talk about the foundations for why oxygen content and oxygen delivery are important, what they are, where they're going to go into the conceptual understanding of oxygen content, what it is, and we're going to break down the equation that calculates oxygen content, relating that to the definitions in physiology so that we can understand it fully. We'll talk about a few different situations to be aware of that affects oxygen content, and then we're going to go into oxygen delivery, which combines certain parts of oxygen content with our heart function. Last, we'll get into some summary statements, and by the end, our hope is that you guys have a full grasp on these Conceptually complex, but also somewhat straightforward mentally concepts. So stick around. We're going to do a quick 60-second break for our introduction, but we'll see you right after. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another video here at Whiteboard Doctor. Thanks for joining us today. Here at Whiteboard Doctor, our mission is to provide you with free, interesting, relevant, understandable medical education and news for all types of lifelong learners, trainees, and practitioners. We have weekly videos that we debut Fridays at 5 p.m. Eastern Time with bonus medical education videos posted throughout the week. We'd love for you to join the Whiteboard Doctor community and follow along by hitting the subscribe button located in the bottom right-hand corner. We also encourage all likes and comments, even if it is just to say hello. All our video descriptions contain links for additional related videos that might be interesting, so don't forget to check those out. And lastly, a quick disclaimer, none of these videos are intended to be acted upon as medical advice. Please pause the video here and read this disclaimer its entirety before moving on. With no further ado, stay well, keep learning, and let's get to the video. All right, thanks for sticking around. So oxygen itself is often the rate limiting molecule in aerobic metabolism. And aerobic metabolism is the way in which our bodies produce energy. All of us, you, me, whoever's listening on the other end of the computer, we take in oxygen by breathing and then our body utilizes that oxygen to create energy. And aerobic metabolism is really the pathway that's kind of the energy powerhouse of the body. And that powerhouse is actually the mitochondria. The mitochondria is an organelle within human cells, almost all human cells. And within the mitochondria, two important cycles occur. One is called the Krebs cycle, and we're not going to go into exactly what the Krebs cycle is. And the other is caused, called oxidative phosphorylation. And essentially what happens is we use glucose sugars in our blood. And through certain reactions, those sugars are converted into different molecules that then enter the Krebs cycle. All right, And the Krebs cycle converts sugar through a number of different reactions into molecules that enter this pathway called oxidative phosphorylation. And oxidative, oxidative being oxygen, utilizes the oxygen we breathe in to kick out a bunch of energy. And that's what ATP is. You can see it written at the bottom here, ATP, adenosine triphosphate. And ATP is how our body uses energy. That wasn't quite worded perfectly, but ATP are the molecules that give energy to our body. And you can see here that the Krebs cycle itself creates two ATP molecules, but oxidative phosphorylation, that reaction that uses oxygen, creates 34 ATP molecules. So the reactions that require oxygen, aerobic metabolism reactions, creating all of this energy, create these 36 total ATP molecules, 
But how does that compare to if we don't have oxygen? Let's say that we um, don't have enough oxygen, we're hypoxic, we have low oxygen levels, or our body is working in overdrive because it's extremely sick, so we don't have enough oxygen to supply the demand our body is requiring. Well, in that case, we actually go into what we call anaerobic metabolism. Aerobic being with oxygen and aerobic being without oxygen. And as comparison, anaerobic metabolism just produces two ATP molecules. And it involves this reaction that takes a molecule called pyruvate and converts it into lactate. And those that work in the hospital might notice that patients who are in shock meaning that you don't have enough oxygen in your body, that your body's demand for oxygen is outpacing its supply, tend to have an elevated lactate. And that is often because your body is going into anaerobic metabolism because the supply of oxygen is not enough for the demand for oxygen. And within anaerobic metabolism, you produce lactate. So you get an elevated lactate. So you can see two ATP compared to 36 ATP, anaerobic versus aerobic. So really oxygen is this molecule that's rate limiting in terms of energy production in the cell. You need oxygen to do aerobic metabolism and aerobic metabolism produces a ton of ATP, which are the body's energy. So why is this important? Just explicitly stating it. Well, in critical illness, when you're critically ill, you need to optimize the content of oxygen in the blood. Content being the amount of oxygen that's physically in the bloodstream. And then you also need to optimize how that oxygen is being delivered to the body right? Because you can have a bunch of oxygen sitting in the bloodstream, but if there's nothing pushing that oxygen through the bloodstream to deliver it to different organs, then it's sitting there is serving no purpose. So those two critical things to optimize aerobic metabolism and supply our organs with enough energy to function involves the oxygen content of the blood as well as how well that oxygen is being delivered to the organs. And those are the two things that we're going to talk about today. Because there's certain things we can intervene on. There's certain things we can do to best optimize these two variables when patients are critically ill. Um, it's something that I, in the intensive care unit, when I'm working clinically, do almost every single day with multiple patients every single day. We're constantly thinking about these things to best optimize the patients and try to supply their organs with enough oxygen to go into aerobic metabolism so they can produce enough energy to supply their body. So starting with oxygen content, what is oxygen content? Well, as we said, oxygen content is literally the amount of oxygen, O2 oxygen, in the blood. But there's a few variables that contribute to that if you think about it, right? So this is kind of just the diagram we drew, drew of our bloodstream, our vascular system. We have arteries, and arteries pump oxygenated blood, right? You can see here these are red blood cells. The green here within the red blood cells are hemoglobin molecules, which hold oxygen. And then the black, you can see, are oxygen molecules, and we have both oxygen dissolved in the bloodstream, and we have oxygen attached to hemoglobin molecules on red blood cells. And these arteries pump this blood to the capillaries. And in the capillaries, that oxygen leaks out into the tissues and muscles to supply oxygen to our muscles and different cells that are outside the bloodstream. And then the veins carry the deoxygenated blood back to the lungs to get oxygenated. Right, that's a very kind of simple um, setup that many of us are aware of. But I wanted to draw it up here because I think it's important to bring it back to the actual things that contribute to the amount of oxygen in the blood because those are directly related to how we calculate, understand, and intervene on optimizing oxygen content. So over here, I wrote out what we just mentioned. You have these circles here. These are the red blood cells, RBCs, red blood cells. And they carry hemoglobin molecules. That's the X. HGB is an abbreviation for hemoglobin. 
And it's not the red blood cell itself that carries oxygen. It's the hemoglobin molecules within the red blood cell. And red blood cells have tons and tons of hemoglobin molecules. And then each hemoglobin molecule, kind of abbreviated by this green X, can carry up to four oxygen molecules. So the red blood cell has a ton of hemoglobin, and each hemoglobin can carry four oxygen. And that's one part of the oxygen content, is kind of this red blood cell hemoglobin carrying the oxygen setup. The other part of the oxygen content in our arteries is we actually just have dissolved oxygen molecules floating around in the bloodstream. They're not bound to any red blood cells, they're just floating around on their own. So it's kind of these two different things, red blood cells that carry hemoglobin and hemoglobin that carries oxygen. So that's one part of the oxygen content. And then the second part is that we just have oxygen floating around in the bloodstream that's just dissolved in there, not bound to any red blood cells. So how do we actually calculate this? And as such, how do we understand what different things we can potentially intervene on to increase the oxygen content in a patient critically ill that does not seem to be able to supply their organs with enough oxygen to do aerobic metabolism and create all that ATP and energy. Well, this is the equation right here. And the equation as written is, I'm going to scroll down, actually we'll keep it where it is. So CaO2 stands for C is content, A is arterial, and O2 is oxygen. So it's the content in the arteries of oxygen, or the oxygen content in the arterial system. And that's this right here, right? The amount of oxygen in the arterial system. So then what makes that up? Well, it's exactly what we talked about. It is the amount of hemoglobin, right? And as we talked about, it is the hemoglobin that carries oxygen within the red blood cells, not the red blood cells themselves. So we don't care about the number of red blood cells. We care about the amount of hemoglobin within all of those red blood cells. And we're going to talk about the units on each of these variables because I do think it's really helpful in terms of understanding the equations and the exact um, things we can intervene on. Um, so the hemoglobin is in grams of hemoglobin per deciliter, DL, deciliter of blood. But the hemoglobin itself isn't oxygen, right? The hemoglobin carries oxygen, but the hemoglobin can only carry as much oxygen as is saturated in the blood. And that's what this variable is. It's the SAO2, or the saturation of oxygen in the arterial system. And if this is 100%, it means almost all the hemoglobin is saturated with oxygen. If this is 80%, it means, you know, only less than 80% of the hemoglobin is saturated with oxygen. In this SAO2, the oxygen saturation, if you've ever looked at a monitor in a patient's room, and those that work in the hospital obviously see this every day, but there's often a square monitor, and the oxygen saturation is usually this kind of blue waveform that looks like this that reads out a percentage. You know, sometimes it's 92%. Um, obviously, it maximizes at 100%, but this is the oxygen saturation, which is saturating the hemoglobin in the arteries. And this percentage, when it reads it out, the way it actually does this is it shoots, you have a, you know, we're going to draw, this is the patient's finger. Sorry, I'm not an artiste. Here's the nail. Here's the, some wrinkles. And you put this sticker over it. It kind of loops over, and it has an infrared sensor. And this percentage that it kicks out is actually, sh it shoots light and it looks at how much hemoglobin with oxygen absorbs that light and gives you a percentage of hemoglobin saturated with oxygen. So literally this measurement here is the saturation of oxygen on hemoglobin. So then what's this 1.34? Well, this is simply a constant, all right? This is the amount of oxygen in milliliters, milliliters of oxygen per gram of hemoglobin. And this is important, right? Because what we have is we have our grams of hemoglobin per deciliter of blood, and then we have how much that hemoglobin is saturated with blood. But what we don't have is um, a unit, 
that allows us to understand how much oxygen O2 there is per milliliter of blood. Because that's what we want to know, because that's the content. We want to know how much oxygen there is in every milliliter of blood. So that's what this constant allows us to do. It literally just allows us to convert these things into the amount of oxygen per milliliter of blood. Okay, so then what's this side of the equation here, right? So we have times, times, and then all of a sudden we have plus. Well, this is the secondary part right here. And it's the amount of oxygen just dissolved within the blood, not connected to hemoglobin and red blood cells. It's just the amount of oxygen that dissolved into the bloodstream that's just floating around on its own. So what we call it is the partial pressure of oxygen dissolved in the arteries, P for pressure, A for arteries, O for oxygen, the partial pressure of oxygen dissolved in the arteries. And then this 0 0.003 is simply another constant. And I'll get into, I'm not sure, I don't remember why I didn't write the um, units up here, uh, but the units here are, uh, let me remind myself, maybe that's why I didn't write them up here. I know I wrote them further down, let's see. Units are milliliters per millimeters of mercury, which are the units of the PaO2, millimeters of mercury, uh, per deciliter. So it's just a constant that allows us, again, to convert this partial pressure, it's a pressure, it's in millimeters of mercury, to actually milliliters of blood. Okay? And we'll get into all this much more in this. Let's break it down. So if we simplify this equation, right, I'll keep kind of this in the um, view so you could see it for now. So CaO2, the, the content of oxygen in the arterial blood. What it equals is what we talked about. The first thing is the amount of oxygen bound to hemoglobin, right? And that is this portion of the equation here, the amount of oxygen bound to hemoglobin, all right? And then the second thing is the amount of oxygen just dissolved in the blood. And that's what this part of the equation is, the amount of oxygen dissolved in the blood. So if we simplify the oxygen content equation, that's what it is. Conceptually, that is all it is. It's just looking at the artery and it's saying how much total oxygen between that connected to hemoglobin and that just straight dissolved in the blood. So then let's break that down. And this is going to be echoing what we talked about above because I think with this topic we need some kind of repetition in different ways. So if we break it down and first look at, here I'll keep this in here, First look at the second portion, the oxygen dissolved in the blood. Well, we get into what we talked about, PaO2, the partial pressure of oxygen in millimeters of mercury, because it's pressure. And how we can understand this is if we go back up here, it's these things. It's the amount of oxygen just floating around dissolved in the blood. But since it's a pressure, its units are millimeters of mercury. And you can find this on an arterial blood gas. It's a lab you can send. You poke the artery and get a blood sample, and it'll literally say on it, PaO2 equals, you know, whatever number, 100 millimeters of mercury. But for this equation, we can't ha leave this just as 100 millimeters of mercury. What we need to know is how that translates into the actual amount of oxygen in the blood in the body. And that's what this 0 0.003 is. It's a constant. And it essentially is the solubility coefficient for oxygen at 37 degrees Celsius, which is the normal temperature of the human body. Now, do keep in mind, if you have fevers or if you're hypothermic, you have a low temperature, obviously this constant is going to change, right? But this is the constant at 37 degrees. And it's the solubility coefficient for oxygen at 37 degrees in blood. And the units here are milliliters per mercury per deciliter. And it'll become more clear why exactly we need these constants. But if you notice this PaO2 is in millimeters of mercury, and you have millimeters of mercury um, on the bottom of the units for this constant, those would obviously cancel out per our rules of math. All right, so this is the amount of oxygen just dissolved in the blood. You get an arterial blood gas, you see what the PaO2 is, and you multiply it by this constant, which is just simply converting the PaO2 in millimeters of mercury into a more usable number, looking at how much at that partial pressure that oxygen is actually soluble 
at 37 degrees in the blood. Um, I do think it's important to note though, right, that again, temperatures can be higher or can be lower than this. So this is just an estimate based on this 37 degrees. So it's not perfect. Technically, you would have to adjust this if you were hyperthermic, aka had a fever, or hypothermic, aka had low temperature. But for reasons we'll talk about later, we don't often do that because this contributes very little to the overall equation, which again, we'll talk about later. All right, so we teased out this portion, the oxygen dissolved in the blood. Now we still need to talk about this portion, the amount of oxygen bound to hemoglobin. And that's this other side of the equation, right? This left side here. And what we can see is oxygen bound to hemoglobin is 1.34 times the amount of hemoglobin in the blood times the saturation of that hemoglobin in the arteries. So breaking that down even more, 1.34, this, just like the 0 0.03, is a constant. And it is essentially that hemoglobin can bind 1.34 milliliters of oxygen when fully saturated which is why this 1.34, the units here, are in milliliters of oxygen per grams of hemoglobin. So again, just like on this side of the equation, this 0 0.03 is really a constant that just makes this a more usable number. Same thing going on here. This 1.34 constant is just making these, uh, when we multiply these together, a more usable number, a more meaningful number, converting it to the amount of oxygen in milliliters that hemoglobin can actually bind, okay? So then with that being said, we're just going to erase these brackets quick. Um, with that being said, the other parts of the oxygen bound to hemoglobin side of the equation is the amount of hemoglobin, right? You can measure this on a CBC, a complete blood count. You can measure it on just the direct hemoglobin hematocrit. Um, and this is a lab value that's typically given in grams of hemoglobin per deciliter of blood. Um, and we can actually write that out, deciliter of blood, grams of hemoglobin. So you can start to see what this is going to do. If we just look at these two um, units, we have milliliters of oxygen per grams of hemoglobin, which is the units of the constant, and we're going to times that to it by the hemoglobin number, which is going to be grams of hemoglobin times deciliters of blood. And without any numbers, if we just cross these out, right, because these will cancel when we multiply together, this is going to equal, in units at least, milliliters of oxygen per deciliter of blood. And those units make a lot more sense when we think about oxygen content, right? Because we're literally saying this is how many milliliters of oxygen is in this many deciliters of blood, all right? And just for those that maybe don't know this offhand, uh, you have one liter, which is one, uh, actually, let's do this. You have 1,000 milliliters per every liter, and you have 10 deciliters per every liter, just so you can kind of get the units. So a deciliter is actually a larger volume than a milliliter. All right, so if we go back to the equation now, what we can see is we have the amount of hemoglobin in the blood, just getting, uh, which you can obtain just by a complete blood count or hemoglobin hematocrit. We have the constant, which is just converting it to a more usable number. And then we have the SAO2. As we talked about, the SAO2 is the oxygen saturation of hemoglobin, and it's given as a percent. And you can actually find this on your arterial blood gas. It'll literally say SAO2 equals you know, 98%. But it's also on that monitor. Everyone's hooked up to a pulse oximeter, and it gives you this waveform that kind of looks like this, and it'll kick out a number, 98%. Now, usually we'll use an arterial blood gas because it often will give you a more exact number. This number might be 98%, then it might be 92%. It's not super, super accurate. Um, so we'll often use an arterial blood gas because that will give you the exact number. Depending on your lab, some arterial blood gas SAO2s are calculated. Some are measured directly. And we actually have a video um, on arterial blood gases. We'll link it in the video description uh, of this video. So check that out if you're interested. But the SAO2 is the amount of oxygen saturation of hemoglobin.
So, you know, you're breathing in oxygen. If you have an oxygen saturation of 100%, that means almost all of your hemoglobin molecules are fully carrying oxygen, right? Because we have red blood cells, red blood cell here. Those red blood cells are full of hemoglobin molecules, bunch of them all over. And each hemoglobin molecule can carry up to four oxygen molecules, which we talked about. So if your oxygen saturation is 100%, that means most of the hemoglobin molecules in your red blood cells are saturated with oxygen. Whereas you might have, you know, five hemoglobin molecules, but if your oxygen saturation is only, this is all arbitrary numbers, but is only 70%, it doesn't matter that you have all these hemoglobin molecules because they're not saturated with oxygen. And what we're looking for, right, is the oxygen content of the blood. So that's why you need this percentage, this SAO2, because you need to know how many hemoglobin molecules there are out there that have the potential to carry oxygen. But then you also have to know how much oxygen is actually connected to the hemoglobin molecules and saturating them. All right? So if we put this all together and kind of write out an example. We're gonna assume a few normals. These are roughly normal numbers. We're gonna assume our hemoglobin is 15 grams per deciliter, right? That's about a normal hemoglobin for males. We're gonna assume our oxygen saturation is 100%, which it often is for young, healthy folks. And at a saturation of 100%, our partial pressure of dissolved oxygen is about 100 millimeters of mercury in the blood, right? Remember, these we can get off an arterial blood gas sample, and this we can just get off of a complete blood count. Um, so that's what you need to calculate your oxygen content, an arterial blood gas, an ABG, and then you need a hemoglobin which you can get off a CBC. So then let's plug it in. So we have that constant, 1.34 milliliters of oxygen for every gram of hemoglobin. And our hemoglobin is 15 grams per deciliter. And our oxygen saturation, right, our SAO2 is 100%. And that's the equation, 1.34, the constant, times the amount of hemoglobin, times the saturation of oxygen in the arterial system. So if we do that math, 1.34 times 15 times 1, right, this is a percentage, so it was 100%, which is 1.00, is going to be 20.1 mils milliliters of oxygen per deciliter of blood. And that works, right? Because for our units, we cancel out grams of hemoglobin, and we're left with this constant made it nice and simple for us. We're left with milliliters of oxygen per deciliter of blood. So the amount of, we're going to scroll up, as we talked about, the amount of oxygen bound to hemoglobin, which is one part of our oxygen content, is 20.1 milliliters of oxygen per every deciliter of blood. But we're not done yet right? Because we need to know how much oxygen is actually dissolved in the blood, not bound to hemoglobin as well. And that, oh, we scrolled too far, that gets us to this portion of the equation, right? The PaO2 times this constant of 0 0.003. In the PaO2, the partial pressure of arterial oxygen, again, taken from an arterial blood gas sample, we said is 100 millimeters of mercury. Millimeters of mercury is the units because it's a pressure, and then we times it by this constant, and the constant is milliliters of oxygen per milliliters of mercury per deciliter, right? So what we do then is we can cancel out millimeters of mercury, and we get 0.3 milliliters of oxygen per deciliter of blood. And lo and behold, now we have the same units, right, on both parts of this equation. And that is really why we have these constants. The constants seem confusing because people are like, well, where'd this number come from? Why do we have it? And it's truly just to convert these numbers to units that are actually conceptually useful, which is milliliters of oxygen per deciliter of blood. So we add these together, and a roughly normal oxygen content is about 20.4 milliliters of oxygen in every deciliter of our blood. And remember, a de deciliter is one-tenth of a liter. All right. The other thing to note here is that the amount of dissolved oxygen in the blood contributes very, very little to the overall number, right? Because it has such a small um, constant. 
So when we're going to talk in a minute about different things in this equation that you can target to change things, the PaO2, the partial pressure of oxygen, has a really small contribution. So now let's talk about some scenarios. What about anemia or low blood counts, right? Our hemoglobin is low. Is that going to affect our oxygen content? Well, first think about it. Will a low amount of hemoglobin affect how much oxygen we have in our arteries? Hopefully the answer is yes, because you've seen the equations. So if we say that our hemoglobin, instead of 15 grams per deciliter, is actually 7 grams per deciliter, so you're anemic. All right, we said NL normal is about 15, and now you're 7. Well, how does that change this equation? Well, the constant is the same, right? The constant that says this is how many milliliters of oxygen are on every gram of hemoglobin. And our oxygen saturation is the same. We're still sat, satting 100%. And our PaO2, our partial pressure of oxygen dissolved in the blood, is also the same. The only difference in this equation is that we're anemic, our hemoglobin's low. But just that alone changes this number. I'm going to scroll up so you can see the other one. Right, changes this number to 9.38 from, with a normal hemoglobin, 20.1. Right? And that changes the final number of oxygen content down to 9.68 milliliters of oxygen per deciliter compared to 20.4 with a normal hemoglobin. So it's less than half, right? You pretty much halved the hemoglobin and your oxygen content is half. That's why those who are anemic, have low blood counts, can have trouble with oxygen content and they can get high heart rates or tachycardia, which we'll get into. Now, what if you're hypoxemic, right? Hypoxemic means you have low oxygen in the blood. Well, two things happen in this equation, right? Because there's two things that contribute to oxygen. And if we go through the equation, our hemoglobin in this case is going to be normal, the 15 grams per deciliter. Obviously, our constant for hemoglobin 1.34 stays the same, but... Instead of 100% oxygen saturation, we're only at 80% because our oxygen is low. We're hypoxemic. <coughs> Excuse us, sorry. And in addition to that, because our oxygen is low, our partial pressure of oxygen, the PaO2 in the arteries, is low too. It's 50. And this is kind of based on the oxygen dissociation curve, which is something we're not going to talk about in this video, although we're happy to in a different video, but it essentially looks like this. And the amount of oxygen saturating in the arteries is proportional to the partial pressure of dissolved oxygen. Um, and if you're at about a PaO2 of 100 millimeters of mercury, it means you're at about 100% oxygen saturation. So if you're only at, you know, 80% PaO2, uh, we actually should write, we didn't draw this very well, but you'd be about 50 per, uh, um, PaO2 of 50 millimeters of mercury. Let's actually just uh, go back here. We will redraw this because we did a poor job. Um, if you are at a PaO2, a partial pressure of dissolved oxygen of 50, then you're at about an 80% oxygen saturation. And this is just the nature of how hemoglobins carry molecules. And again, if you're interested in that topic, um, we're happy to cover it in a, a separate lecture. Um, but hypoxemic, you have low oxygen in the blood, so you are at an 80% oxygen saturation of those hemoglobin molecules and a partial pressure of dissolved oxygen in the blood of 50. Well, that's gonna change both sides of the equation, right? Compared to over here where just one side was changed and you get 16 milliliters of oxygen per deciliter of blood plus 0.15, and then you end up with 16.23 milliliters of oxygen per deciliter. So you can see these two things are both big drivers, low blood counts and low oxygen in the blood. What about, though, if you increased the oxygen a ton? Let's say even though your oxygen saturation is 100%, you still give them a bunch of extra oxygen to increase their PaO2. Well, that's where it's important to note that this portion of the equation, right, this portion up here, the amount of dissolved oxygen, does not contribute that much because of that 0.003 constant. 
So as we mentioned, there's this entity known as the oxygen disassociation curve. And what it essentially says is that at some point, your hemoglobins are 100% saturated. That's this y-axis, the SaO2. Your hemoglobins are 100% saturated. But you can still keep giving someone supplemental oxygen, right? Even if you're at 100% saturation, I probably live at 99 or 100% oxygen saturation. But if someone starts giving me 15 liters of supplemental oxygen, my PaO2, the amount of dissolved oxygen, will increase, you know, it might go up to 300 millimeters of mercury. But that oxygen saturation stays 100%, right? And that's where you get this curve. At some point, you can't increase the amount of oxygen your hemoglobin is carrying because that's what the SaO2 is. It's the amount of oxygen saturating your hemoglobin molecules. And at some point, all those hemoglobin are saturated. And if I start giving more oxygen, it's not going to increase how many hemoglobin are saturated because they're already 100% saturated. But it will increase the amount of dissolved oxygen in my blood. The amount of oxygen that just as a molecule itself is floating around in there. Will that increase the amount of oxygen content? Is that something we should be doing, right? Let's say someone's got a normal hemoglobin, their oxygen saturation is 100%, but they're in septic shock or they're really sick and their body is in a degree of anaerobic metabolism. Should I be giving them a bunch of supplemental oxygen to drive up their PaO2? The answer is it doesn't really contribute too much, right? So this is 1.34, the constant, it's normal. Our hemoglobin's 15 grams per deciliter, normal. Our oxygen saturation is 100%, 100%, but we're giving more supplemental oxygen, right? More and more and more. So we're still at 100% SaO2, but our PaO2 is 300 millimeters of mercury. Well, it only increases the oxygen content to 30 mils compared to 20.4 mils. Um, yep, compared to 20.4 mils. And that's barely anything. And when they study this, Wait, we actually totally did our math wrong. It's not 30 mils. So you're at 20.4 mils, right? 20.1 plus 0.9. You are not up to 30. You are up to, I was like, that actually is kind of a lot. Um, and it is because that's wrong. You're only up to 21 milliliters of oxygen per deciliter of blood. And that's very, very little compared to the 20.4 you were before. And when they study this, giving people a bunch of extra supplemental oxygen often is actually bad because you can get superoxide species and some things that, again, outside the scope of this video. But the summary statement is driving the oxygen levels in your blood beyond what is 100% saturation of your hemoglobin does very little in terms of increasing your oxygen content. The hemoglobin, your blood counts, the amount of hemoglobin actually contributes the most to the oxygen content. And that's what we wrote out on the left here. Additional oxygen besides what is required to saturate hemoglobin is essentially negligible. It doesn't really contribute too much. So the next part of this video is oxygen delivery. So oxygen delivery, we copied and pasted this same graphic that we used for understanding oxygen content. And we talked about in that video how oxygen content is secondary to the components that carry oxygen in the arterial blood, being hemoglobin, and dissolved oxygen. But keep in mind, if this is just stagnant, if it's not moving, it doesn't matter how much oxygen is in the blood because you need something to pump that blood forward to then deliver it. And that's where the heart comes in, right? The left side of the heart, this is a heart, the left side of the heart squeezes in and pumps blood through the arteries to deliver this arterial oxygen content to the tissues. And that's the other part of the oxygen delivery equation. So this is uh, more simplistic than the oxygen content, which we talked about previously. We're going to focus on this side of the equation now. So DO is oxygen delivery, right? Makes sense. Delivery of oxygen. And it equals the CO, the cardiac output, how much blood our heart is squeezing out times the content of oxygen in that blood. And there's some um, constants here that we'll talk about just to convert units. The cardiac output is typically in liters of blood that it pumps out per minute. And the oxygen content is typically in milliliters of oxygen per deciliter of blood. 
So you can think in your brain how those units make sense, right? Because you're looking at how much blood is being pumped per minute, and then you're looking how much oxygen is in that blood that is being pumped per minute. So how does that equate? Well, again, in that previous video, we talked about the oxygen content equation. And this is the oxygen content equation, and we're not going to kind of go over it in detail again. We're going to focus on the cardiac output portion of this equation. So delivery of oxygen equals the cardiac output times the oxygen content equation. And the cardiac output equals the SV, the stroke volume, times the heart rate. So how does that make sense? So cardiac output is going to be the volume of blood that is pumped out of the heart during each beat, right? So if we draw the heart, let's just say the, the left ventricle is a circle. It's, I mean, parts of it are kind of circular, but when it squeezes, the muscles contract and move inward, pumping blood out. And every squeeze is one beat. And the stroke volume is the amount of blood pumped out in milliliters per every beat. But the amount of blood that leaves the heart per minute depends on both the volume pumped out per beat and the number of beats per minute. So the cardiac output being liters of blood per minute equals the stroke volume times the heart rate, right? the volume of blood in milliliters being pumped out in every beat, and then the number of beats per minute. So you multiply the cardiac output by the oxygen content to get the amount of oxygen being delivered, right? Because the cardiac output is the amount of blood being pumped per minute, and the oxygen content is the amount of oxygen within that blood that is being pumped. The only thing to note in the oxygen delivery equations is there's some constants, because we need to convert milliliters to liters, right? You can see it here. And then we also need to convert deciliters in the oxygen content to liters. So if we draw all of this out and use real numbers, what we have here is that the oxygen delivery, DO, oxygen delivery, is equal to the stroke volume, which normally is, can be, it's variable, but about 50 milliliters of blood pumped out of the heart per beat of the heart times 100 beats of the heart per minute. Again, these are all ranges, you know, 60 to 100 beats per minute is what they say is typically normal. 50 milliliters to 100 milliliters of blood per beat is normal, but we're just going to use these numbers. But then we need to convert milliliters to liters. So then you do divide that by a thousand. All right. So if we multiply that, you get 5,000 milliliters of blood pumped out of the heart per minute times, right, one liter per thousand milliliters, which gets you five liters per minute of blood for normal cardiac output. But then we also need to do the oxygen delivery. And again, we've talked about all of these numbers. When you multiply all this together, you get about 20.4 milliliters of oxygen within each deciliter of blood. And to convert that to liters of blood, we have... 10 deciliters in every liter. So multiply it by 10 deciliters per liter. Deciliters cancel out. And you get 200.4 milliliters of oxygen in every liter of your blood. So that's kind of interesting to think about, right? In every liter of your blood, you have 20.4 milliliters of oxygen just about. And this is the oxygen content, right? Which we abbreviate CaO2, oxygen content. So if you multiply this together, your oxygen delivery is about 1,020 milliliters of oxygen per every minute circulating around your body. Kind of interesting, right? So now that we've gone through the equations, a few different summary points to think about. How clinically should we think about this? Well, clinically, in someone who does not have enough oxygen delivery, right? Their DAO2 is low. Optimizing your cardiac output by either optimizing your stroke volume, that might be someone's dehydrated and they need fluids to increase how much blood's going into the heart to be pumped out, or increasing your heart rate can go a long way. So typically, cardiac output 
is the thing that's most often modulated to increase your oxygen delivery. That's why we get tachycardic, why we get fast heart rates. Someone comes in with a, an acute bleed and they're anemic and they're not and they're struggling to have enough oxygen content, their heart rate goes up. Because if their heart rate goes up, if we look at this equation that we've now drawn all over, um, if their oxygen content is low because their hemoglobin's low, but their heart rate goes up, you might still be able to achieve the same amount of oxygen delivery. And that's why we get fast heart rates. Same thing if we're hypoxemic, if we have low oxygen in our bloods. So let's say you have pneumonia or a blood clot in your lungs. The amount of oxygen content goes down because you have low um, SAO2 and low PaO2. Your heart rate goes up and your oxygen delivery can stay the same. Now, eventually, you'll tip off this curve. Eventually, you won't be able to mobilize enough heart rate or stroke volume, enough cardiac output to meet the demand of the body given your lower oxygen content. And at some point, your oxygen delivery will drop. And when your oxygen delivery drops, that's where you go into anaerobic metabolism, right? You start producing all that lactate. You can't produce enough energy and uh, you, you get in some trouble. But that's why we get faster heart rates. We're compensating for lower oxygen content or a higher demand for oxygen in the body. Additional clinical point, anemia, low blood counts have a more pronounced effect on oxygen delivery than low oxygen values. And that's when we talked about how this side of the equation, right, you have your SAO2, which is important, but then you also have that 0 0.003 times your PaO2. And these values contribute less than your hemoglobin, because remember your hemoglobin, you're actually multiplying by a higher constant, 1.34, whereas you're multiplying your PaO2 by 0 0.03. So your blood counts contribute a lot more to oxygen content and delivery than the oxygen levels in your blood. And there are certain situations, you know, early on in, in septic shock when you have low blood pressure because you have a really bad infection, um, they actually would transfuse blood to increase the hemoglobin with the goal being to improve oxygen delivery. And this is no longer often done, although there are situations where it is still done, but it's not very common. It's no longer kind of standard of care guidelines. But the hemoglobin contributes much more to oxygen delivery than low oxygen hypoxemia does. All right. And just note, there's many regional blood flow differences that affect delivery. These are kind of, um, you know, forest from the trees concepts and uh, the kidneys, right? The kidneys have autoregulation that affects their blood flow um, and oxygen delivery. Different tissue beds have different uh, auto-regulatory regional blood flow things that affect oxygen delivery. So this is a good principle to know, but there are kind of some microcosms that, that change this a little bit. So hopefully that was interesting and helpful. I know it's very complex and dense. Appreciate you sticking with us. Uh, in future, we're going to cover oxygen consumption and extraction. So stay tuned for that at some point. Subscribe, hit the bell button. Let us know what thoughts, comments, questions you have down below. Uh, we appreciate you all. Stay well, keep learning, and we will see you all next time.